Hi everyone, welcome back from the first round of videos from your first visit to the posters and a couple of uh, breaks. So I'm happy to introduce our first keynote speaker, but I won't be doing this myself. I'll leave the task to Matthias and Marlene, who will be chairing this keynote session. So Matthias, the stage is yours. Thanks, Floris, um, and I'm glad to be here together with Marlene to present this first keynote. Um, yeah, we are very excited to have Polina Goland as our first keynote speaker. Um, she's a Henry Warren Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in MIT in Boston, um, and she's also Principal Investigator of CSAIL Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab there. She um, is or was Associate Editor uh, at TMI and PAMI um, and is currently on the board of Medical Image Analysis. Um, and she's also a fellow of MICAI, um, Medical Image Computing and Computer Assistant Interventions. Um, she also organized a very successful event, uh, MICAI 2014 in Boston. Um, and she and her group are primarily researching in developing new methods for uh, medical image analysis, in particular shape analysis. So we are really excited to hear more from her um, in her keynote entitled From Pixels to Clinical Insight placental MRI analysis. The floor is all yours, Polina. So what is placenta? For, for those of you who have not, so when I do this talk live, I would, uh, if I did this talk live, I would ask you to actually raise your hands and tell me if you know where your placenta is. But here I'll spare everybody the embarrassing sort of uh, experience of uh, voting online and um, just explain what it is. So placenta is the organ, it's a fetal organ, and it's shown here, in red, um, it's an organ that connects to the fetal uh, blood supply and to the uterus wall. And inside the placenta, basically the blood vessels of the mother, the capillaries of the maternal, um, of the fetal uh, circulatory system are based in maternal blood, in these pools of maternal blood. And that's where oxygen and nutrients go from the mother to the fetus. And um, the waste, basically the waste products go back into the maternal blood, blood supply. And so this is how the placenta effectively provides all of the nutrients for the fetus during the first nine months. And then it's born with the fetus and discarded. And from that point on, nobody has a placenta. So it's this unique organ that all of us had one off for the first nine months of our lives. And then nobody has it when they walk around in the street as an adult or even as a kid. And so we have been building tools to image the placenta and understand its function. So I'll show you a little bit of a sort of the type of MRI that we are doing. So this MRI is actually exactly the same contrast that functional imaging is done with. It's sensitive to oxygen. And here I'm showing you just one cross section, but actually it's a full volume, full 3D volume, fast MRI acquisition. And so you can see a silhouette of one fetus for sort of like to make it even more entertaining. This is actually twin pregnancy. And so you can see the, the head of the twin sort of popping in and out of this cross section. But our focus will be entirely on the placenta, which you can see sort of like on the, in the lower left in the lower left corner of the image. And as you can, as I mentioned before, it's attached to the wall. And so our goal is to understand how the placenta functions. Why? Well, because there is a lot of evidence from pathology analysis of the placenta that has been born um, that disruptions in placenta or deterioration of the function of the placenta has dramatic effect on fetal development and fetal pathologies. It's not surprising because effectively placenta acts as an energy and uh, oxygen supply 
basically food and oxygen supply for the fetus. So if the placenta ages faster than the fetus, for example, the physician have a real decision to make on when to induce delivery if aging of the placenta might impede development of the fetus. And so our goal is to understand the function through imaging. So I will show you a couple of projects that we have done to push us closer to this understanding, as well as speculate on what else needs to be done for us to actually be able to study placenta for real. So the first project that I want to tell you about aims to image the function of the placenta specifically as it relates to supply of oxygen. So let me play this video. Here. And so what's happening here is that we selected the case where in some sense we are lucky. And I brightened out in the image everything that is not the placenta. So you can kind of see the brain of the fetus, but not quite. So this is a little bit of a lucky case. And the reason why it's lucky is because placenta is what's called posterior. It's in the back. It's very close to the maternal spinal cord. You can the spinal canal. You can kind of see the spine right here. And so as a result, it moves very little. The anterior placenta uh, moves a lot when the mother is breathing and moving. But the posterior placenta typically will move much less. So as a result, we can watch what happens to it without having to worry about compensating for anything. And I should also tell you that the way this experiment was run is that the mother is lying in the scanner and doing nothing. It's basically a rest take scan. But at 10 minutes on the graph on the right here, uh, the mother is wearing oxygen mask. And at 10 minute mark, she will start breathing pure oxygen instead of room air. And at 20 minutes, the oxygen again will stop and room air will be provided for breathing. And so we will watch the intensity of the placenta as this movie goes. So here we go. The time moves and it gets closer. You can see a bit of a movement here. At 10 minutes here, the mother is breathing oxygen. Can you see the intensity dramatically increasing? It's because basically we're using blood oxygen sensitive protocol and we can watch the flow of oxygen from the mother to the fetus inside the placenta. So I think it's really, really cool. Effectively, we have a direct measurement of oxygen in the placenta. And so the question is, can we do something quantitative with it in every placenta as opposed to this placenta that happened to line up really right, great and we got to watch this. So uh, the way we will do it, ideally, again, this is an audience that I don't need to lecture about. You would like to analyze these changes locally and understand where the local changes on the map of changes correlates with the function of the placenta. As a first step, we will average the intensity over the whole placenta. But even that is hard because there is a lot of motion. So in this very first project, what we did is we did almost everything by hand. What we did was we registered the volumes, the successive volumes, uh, to a template volume, which is the first frame in the series, um, segmented the placenta and averaged its intensity. And so this is what you're seeing in the graph here. It's average intensity of MRI, of this particular MRI, um, as a function of time. And you can definitely see a very large increase in the average intensity. So the question is, how do you quantify it? So in some sense here, I swept under the rug all the medical image analysis that had to happen. And I'll come back to it later. But here, I just want to show you what you can do if you have image analysis working. So the intent, so now I'm plotting the changes in the MRI intensity as these circles, which are measurements. We are going to fit a parametric curve to it that comes from physiological modeling of these type of signals. So we're modeling it as a gamma function and then estimate the time that it takes placenta to rise to this new maximum. So, so it turns that in this particular study, we've done experiments with intensity, how much it rises, as well as the delay in the rise. So this is the delay of oxygen from maternal to fetal side in the placenta in some sense, satura to saturation on the fetal side. And so we're condensing this amazing modality to one number, which is how fast the intensity got to saturation. And so here's what you can do with that. And this is a study we've done at this point uh, probably four or five years ago. Um, 
the challenge with deriving biomarkers of placental function is that there's a huge amount of variability in fetal and placental development across individuals. And so to remove this variability from confounding our, our analysis, we chose to work with twins. We are also kind of fortunate that one of the maternal specialists that we are working with is really interested in twins. And so we get sort of this very steady supply of twins to twin volunteers to image. And so the study will be that we take the placenta and delineate a region that corresponds to twin A and twin B. In all of the in all of the analysis, this is analysis of a seven twin pairs. And because again, the measurements are so variable, we'll do every pair separately. But notice that these twins provide perfect control for each other because they are genetically identical. This is uh, uh, this is monozygotic twins. And they grow in roughly the same environment. The only thing that's different is the placental function in the region that feeds each twin. I should also say that in this study, the twins share the placenta. So it really is the region that feeds the twin as opposed to the twin specific placenta. And so what we found is that if you plot the type to plateau biomarker that I just described, and against it, brain volume, liver volume at imaging time. And what's shockingly to me, also birth weight, meaning many weeks after the imaging was done, then this biomarker is highly predictive of which twin will be bigger, have bigger volume, and so on. And so in every single one of these pairs, uh, we see that the bigger twin has shorter time to plateau than the smaller twin. So this means that the time to plateau is predictive of the birth weight weeks and weeks before the twins are born. So it seems that we are onto something here. And right now we're developing several different studies to look more carefully at both how much the signal is rising and the time to plateau to develop it into a biomarker that works for singletons for whom there isn't a genetic control. But this gives us sort of the first indication that watching oxygen in the placenta can be very useful in terms of correlating with the development of the twin. Moreover, it's not just that uh, macro measurement is disrupted. If we look at the placenta after it was delivered and look at the exceed locations in the placenta, so the blue ones here, that are exceedingly far out on the time that it takes the oxygen to arrive, it correlates with fairly pathological histology when the placenta is delivered and somebody looks under the microscope. So this is going from physiolog from sort of histological measurements to something like macro measurement of fMRI, of MRI. I keep calling it fMRI because it's exactly the same protocol. To predicting developmental measurements such as birth weight. So birth weight, it turns out, is the biggest predictor of how well the child will do in the first couple of years of uh, their development. So it turns out that if your grandmother was insisting on feeding you a lot when you were a kid, she knew something intuitively that the medicine is discovered, has discovered over and over again, which is bigger babies are healthy babies. Okay, and we are starting to develop biomarkers that are predictive of that in utero. Okay, and so this slide also is supposed to remind me that I swept all of the image analysis under the rug, but there is quite a bit of image analysis that you have to do before you get to the point of measuring the biomarker. And the first point that I want to address is the fact that it's very hard to see the placenta in 3D because every section just cuts across it. Every MRI slice gives you one 2D section of this cup-like structure. Effectively, it's a sponge that is attached to the curvy wall of the uterus. And so this is exactly what I want to talk about next. So the image on the right is an image of the placenta that was delivered and placed on the table. It's sponge-like, so it takes the shape of whatever surface you put it on. And so here, and this is how a pathologist is used to examining it. They put it on a table, it becomes a disc, sort of, and you can see the umbilical cord attaching. Now, 
our goal is to make 3D volumetric measurements and somehow correlate them with what's happening in the shape of a placenta during after delivery. And in particular, to make it easier to see the structure and the function of the placenta, what we are going to do is take the placenta as it is in the volume that was acquired, extract the tetrahedral mesh, meaning volumetric mesh, then flatten it, and then drag the intensity of the points with the points so that we can see a flattened view of the placenta. So instead of these uh, dots on the left that we blobs on the left that we don't really it's very hard to make sense of we end up with this honeycomb structure in a flattened view that is a well-known structure to pathologists who look at placenta after it was delivered these bright lakes bright blobs are called cotyledons they correspond to these lakes of maternal blood that basically in the, through which the capillaries of the fetal blood uh, system, vessel system go and get oxygen and nutrients. So let me tell you how we're doing it. We're going to model it as piecewise affine registration, piecewise affine matching or parameterization, which means that every tetrahedron in the placenta maps the tetrahedron in a flattened space, and you can model it as a linear transformation, meaning there is translation. For every point, for every point of the mesh, there is a translation component, and this JK is basically the Jacobian matrix. It captures how much the tetrahedron both rotates and, and squishes or stretches, where ZK is the coordinates of the points in the original coordinate system. And we, are think, we will think of it as an optimization. So phi is a function that we will minimize, and it's a function of the new location of the points, and it has two terms, how well we are matching to the template and how distorted the placenta is. So let me tell you how, so the, the matching to the template is only of a boundary vertices, and in a second it will become obvious why. The, the distortion term is over all tetrahedra. So the template is two planes. We've experimented with ellipsoids. We've experimented with letting one plane off. And it seems like the actual the most informative pictures from the point of view of somebody who investigates the placenta afterwards is these two planes that are parallel to each other. And our goal is to map the maternal side to the bottom plane, which is minus height. And the fetal side, which is just painted here in blue, to the top plane. So our template template term is trivial. It basically takes the third coordinate of every point and penalizes difference between minus H or plus H, depending on whether it's fetal or maternal. You could say, well, wait a second. So there is maternal, fetal, what's in between? And that's the rim. So let me look at this a little bit more carefully. When we have a placenta, so here is a visualization of a placenta just distracted from the segmentation. What we'd like is to partition it into maternal and maternal on the outside and fetal side of the placenta. Here on the zoom in panel, I'm showing you the normals of every point that is computed as an average of the tetrahedra. And you can see that over the maternal side and over the fetal side, the normals don't change that fast as they move from side to side. But the inner rim is where they move quite a bit. They change quite a bit as I move along the rim. So we are going to perform spectral clustering by looking at the similarity in the normals. And so all of these paintings that I've been showing you where the maternal is, um, is uh, painted gray and then there is a red rim and the blue fetal are uh, extracted using spectral clustering where we cluster the points based on their similarity and their normals. This is kind of very old technology. We just sort of, in some sense, almost use it off the shelf. We just had to understand what the size of the rim is that led to very nice separation. Okay, so now let's talk about distortion. For distortion, we will use symmetric Delachere energy, and it will take the Jacobian matrix and penalize its Fabinius norm. For those of you who are saying, oh my God, I don't know what that is, it's just the sum of the eigenvalues. So if the stretching is very anisotropic, then some of the eigenvalues will be large, and that will be a big penalty. And of course, Jacobian minus one, meaning the inverse, because we don't want it to spring. 
we also so the second term gives you the sum of the inverse of the eigenvalues. So here is one way to see it. As I'm shrinking it, the eigenvalues are the eigenvalue is shown in the red, and the eigenvalue in, a reciprocal of eigenvalue is shown in blue. And so you can see that the two terms effectively explode as I shrink or expand the tetrahedron too much. So it will try to force local distortion to not be too much by keeping tetrahedra close to the original shape. So again, here is our cost function. I should say that this is actually a little bit different because we're adding the height. We will also optimize over the height of the template. Once we match it, we can visualize flattened placenta. So it's exactly what we do. Here is an MRI slice. Then we extract the tetrahedral mesh from the segmentation. Then we map the tetrahedral mesh, well, we segment it into fetal and maternal through spectral clustering. We map it to the template, which basically just flattens the maternal and fetal side, sorry. And then we take the, for every voxel, so this is a visualization of what happens to every voxel. For every voxel, we take the, its barycentric coordinates inside the tetrahedron in the original space and move, move them, map them to the map space, and that allows us to map the intensities together with the coordinates. So this is a very stable mapping. At this point, we've tested it on about 100 subjects, a little bit over 100 subjects. It generates nice flattened representations. It gives us somewhat in sensitivity to maternal position. So here, the pairs I acquire, the pairs of placenta are following the same mother, acquired in a different position. So you can see that the, amb the shape of the placenta changes quite a bit, but the flattened representation doesn't. We had a little bit of fun and embedded flat MIT into the flattened placenta to visualize how much easier it is to read structure of the placenta in a flattened view. Whereas if you look at the cross sectional slices, you can barely see one letter. So it would be very hard to tell what the structure is. Here's a little bit more serious example where it looks at two catalytons that are very easy to see where they are relative to each other. And in fact, they're very far from each other in the flattened placental view that corresponds to the anatomically correct way to think about it. Whereas they might be very close in the MRI. We also look at the placental in a cross-sectional slice, and that's actually the image on the uh, image at the bottom, and see that these catalytons can be thought of as columns through the placenta rather than just disks in one slice. And we have computational measure and statistics that say, say that we do very well in terms of local distortion. And so what can you do with this? You can, for example, watch the contraction. So the plot on the right, again, shows you as a function of time, local distortion, change in volume that is, and signal. So people have always suspected that the signal might change depending on whether the placenta goes through contraction or not. And so here indeed we have this visualization where it's very easy to see that as we go through the contraction, the intensity changes substantially. And so it used to be thought as a bug in the sense that it's hard to study the placenta when it goes through contraction. Right now, we have a project that actually studies contractions by looking at how the oxygen, for some reason, these contractions basically squeeze the oxygen out in some sense. Well, they squeeze the blood out, oxygenated blood out, and that removes the oxygen, and as a result, there is a signal drop. So it gives you a really nice window into what um, can be done once we can measure and flatten. Now, again, what everything I've shown you uses very elementary tools for segmentation and registration of the placenta. What we are doing right now um, is building automatic pipelines for doing very robust segmentation and longitudinal registration of the placenta. And I hope to tell you about this in a couple of years when we actually have the tools available and happy to share. I was going to tease you with our next project on imaging the placenta, ex, placenta ex vivo, but in the interest of time and not to derail the whole timing, I'll conclude now, and I'm very happy to hear from you if you want to hear about sort of current developments in the imaging. And before I conclude, I would like to again thank my collaborators on this project, who are numerous and amazing, and generous funding from NIH and our corporate sponsors. 
So to summarize, what I've shown you today is that MRI captures function and anatomy of the placenta. And by doing image analysis on, um, on these images, we extract real physiological measurements that are indicative of the function that can be clinically actionable. So this provides us with a path towards clinically relevant analysis of function of the placenta as it relates to fetal development. And you can say, where is the machine learning? And the answer is the machine learning is all in the image analysis part that actually takes the um, placenta, segments the placenta and registers the placenta. So there, for those of you who are thinking about what the next project you should be doing, this is definitely has been one of the best kind of data that I worked with because nothing works as we try it out of the box. And as a result, there are lots of interesting developments in terms of doing research for this. And with that, I thank you and I'm happy to answer a question as to if we have time. Uh, presentation so um, so well with the technical issues. Um, we, we can start with um, some question from from us first before uh, we we have the um, general audience. So um, a lot of this stuff you you showed uh, requires quite um, um, high technology for for acquiring these um, these MRI images. Is, is there any any way forward to um, to implementing this in, the, in a more low cost scenario to to give more access to um, to other parts of the world for this? Uh, that's a great question. So um, to clarify, it, it's sort of I think of it as staging, right? So right now what we are, do what we are doing is we're developing tools. And so in this stage, effectively we assume that everything is possible. And then the question is how do you scale it for real uses, real applications? And so because we're focusing on supporting research right now, because so little is known about how placenta develops, we assume that you can have MRI scan. And so I should say that the sequences that we're using exist on every MR scan in, the, in, in any of the hospitals that anybody in this conference collaborates with. In fact, it's standard MRI sequence. So it's standard API volumes in, uh, acquired in a fairly standard resolution. So there was nothing um, extremely specific to, to the placenta that was developed. Now, the real question is, can you change this? Can you translate this to ultrasound? Because actually, most pregnancies are monitored with ultrasound, and it's only if there is suspicion of complications, women get referred to high power centers that have MRI and fetal MRI. And so I think the path forward with that is to understand the biomarkers in MRI and then do joint modeling of MRI and ultrasound so that we can start seeing the shadows of the signals in ultrasound. But we wouldn't have hope of identifying an ultrasound itself, but uh, with the help of R, we can characterize the signatures of ultrasound that are indicative of what you would have seen in MRI. And then maybe we can detect them in ultrasound. Thank you. Um, so there's a, a question from uh, from the audience from uh, Mikhail Tari. Um, he thanks for your presentation and wonders whether you find any pathological cases where the proposed models could not be applicable, and if yes, how how would you deal with it? Uh, so right now, uh, this is also a fantastic question. Yeah. So pathology is hard. All of us love working on you know almost regular images. Uh, the pathological image looks a little bit different. And so right now, because our numbers are small, a lot of times what happens is that the medical image analysis requires a lot of manual intervention where people go in and do, for example, manual segmentations instead of automatic ones. And a great question is, how do you develop machine learning methods that can deal with pathology? Now, the biomarker part that I told you about, we 
very simple because it's just one number. And as a result, it's very, very robust. All we're doing is we're averaging intensity of the placenta across the placenta. As we start moving into localized analysis and detect areas of pathology, this issue will come up again. And so we're doing effectively kind of several stage process. One of them is we start with mental annotation and then we start building robust methods that can deal with the pathology. I think uh, we lost Malene for a second. Um, so I, I just continue on her behalf. Um, there's another question from, from the um, audience. And in, in this imaging and modeling, have you noticed different placenta behaviors for patients who experience complications such as partial or complete placenta um, previa, previa? Yes. We haven't looked carefully at placenta previa. Those of you who don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> so placenta attaches kind of randomly inside the uterus. Basically, it can be in any location along the uterine wall. And the unfortunate case is that sometimes it attaches in such a way that it covers the surface, which is the opening through which the baby is born. And so this is very risky for the mother and for the baby. Because if the placenta ruptures during um, during delivery, basically it creates lots and lots of complications, bleeding the, being the primary one. And so placenta preview usually is uh, monitored very carefully through pregnancy. So effectively, like you are more ambitious than we are. We're starting small and we're looking at places where, sorry, we're looking at problems where the placenta is attached so that there is no complication there. But for example, we're looking at yeah, uh, high BMI and so on. So areas where the the, where the mother does have some some symptoms developing that would indicate complications. We're also looking at what's called restrictive uterine growth, which means the baby is not growing as fast as possible, as fast as it should, and looking at correlates with placenta. And so placenta preview is a very fascinating topic, but we haven't gotten there yet. Basically, our tools have to be much better to be able to help uh, with planning, effectively in placenta previa, what you want to do is to plan the delivery very carefully. And we hope there, but not, we're not there yet. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a small technical question, and maybe I, this is just to, due to my misunderstanding, but as far as I um, I understood you, you are treating the uh, kind of segmentation and generation of the surface mesh as kind of two separate steps um, and, and then doing, doing the analysis with uh, your, your shape models. Um, ha have you considered do doing this in, in, in like a, a whole end-to-end uh, -end, um, deep network or? Yeah. Effectively like shape, active shape models for placenta while uh, with deep net, right, something like that. where we parameterize the placenta and detect the image so that we get parameterization in one step. And so, yes, this is exactly what we're working on right now. Effectively, we're developing deep networks that will do segmentation and parameterization at once. So this is actually an interesting confluence of machine learning, effectively, effectively geometric machine learning and standard functional networks. And as I said, I hope be at middle a couple of years from now presenting this work. <laughs> Great. Sounds perfect. The Zoom environment has not been ideal as my talk has demonstrated amply. Uh, for those of you who are curious about this project, I like hearing from people. Just send me an email and I'll be very happy to, again, catch on Zoom, but hopefully the connection will be better and talk about it more. Or for students who are interested in sort of thinking about the next project, it's very easy to find and I usually respond to the email. Excellent. So, um, Unless uh, Malene also wanted to uh, ask another question, you, you were also dropping out shortly from the um, from the meeting. I I would like to um, 
big, give a, a big round of applause again to Polina for her, her very, very interesting uh, presentation. And, and as you just said, uh, you're all welcome to, to contact them um, if, you, if you're interested in um, discussing this more um, and finding out more about um, her research. Great, thank you so much for being here, Polina. So, um, Phyllis, do you want to make a short announcement? Yes. So, thank you, Matthias, for chairing the keynote, and thank you, Marlene, as well. And of course, also, thank you, Polina, for giving this really fascinating and interesting talk. Due to the technical issues we experienced, the program is a little late. Of course, you have realized it. Um, we're not exactly on time, we're about 10 minutes over time, but I think there is no conference that doesn't go over time, so I don't think this is a big deal. So we're looking forward to the next long oral session, which will take place in this exactly same spot, so you can just stay in the meeting. And I hand over to the session chairs of this second long oral session. Enjoy those videos. <laughs>